Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. And for those of us online, thank you as well. Um, I'd like to welcome to everyone to tonight's Unpack session, Exploring Fostering. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on Dara country and that the legal implications of invasion remain unresolved to this day. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. My name is Naima Ibrahim. I'm a fiction writer by my actual day job, to the surprise of many, is as an early childhood professional. I work specifically in early intervention space for young children. Um, just some housekeeping for tonight. We do have a break at around 8 to 10 p.m. tonight. The program will finish, inshallah, at 9 o'clock. First half of the event will be the discussion with the panel, and the second half will be Q&A, so get your questions ready. Um, bathrooms are located outside the glass doors. Turn right and then left to get there. Um, and some disclaimers. So the opinions tonight represent those of speakers and do not reflect ISRA's stance. This is a judgment-free space where we can share opinions and our own lived experiences. Speakers are not providing general advice or are not providing general or religious advice. They are here to speak to their experiences only and their expertise. In tonight's session of Unpack, we will be exploring fostering within the Muslim community. And for those of you who are, if, if this is your first Unpack series, um, just a bit of background. Unpack is a series that aims to unpack socially difficult and complex conversations concerning Muslims today through raw discussions facilitated by a diverse panel. Um, and a bit of background about the topic that we're discussing today. So 50,000, it is estimated that 50,000 children enter the foster care system with 2.6% of these children being Muslim. As a Muslim community, we have a communal obligation, a fard kifaya, to ensure the future of our youth is raised well and within the Muslim community. How are we doing as a community in this space? How deep, broad and immediate is the need and what opportunities are available to us? To help us navigate this topic, we have two speakers and I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Just a note, unfortunately, Ahmed Malas is unwell and was unable to join us tonight. Um, I'll start off with Sheikh first. Assalamu alaikum wa ta'ala. This is Mahmoud Azhari. I am uh, Imam from Al-Azhar Sharif in Egypt and I've been here for uh, 10 years working as an Imam now for the Sydney North Muslim community. Um, and also the, from the executive, I'm the, a member of the executive committee of uh, ARIC, uh, National, National Imams Council. And um, yeah, that's it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi My name is Mahmoud Abdullah. I am a foster carer. And I've been a foster care for the past eight, nine years. That's a lot. And then, um, alhamdulillah, it's been a very, very amazing journey. from the yeah. Um, personal background is I'm a site manager, um, a senior manager. So it's a fun blow when you take in what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, plus fostering and looking after children, mm -hmm. it always comes in hand in hand because I'm always looking after someone. Yeah. It's a fun blow. So you have, you have children as well? Yes, so I have not my own. So Alhamdulillah, I mean, I've been blessed with the ability to be able to adopt my son. Alhamdulillah, I And I currently have my foster daughter, who I'm in the process of also adopting. And within the time space that I've had being a foster carer, Alhamdulillah, my wife and I have been um, mums and dads to 17, 17 beautiful. Allah What a vision, man. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, thank you for the invitation. I hope I can provide some insight tonight and inshallah we have a okay. and good time with you guys. Inshallah. We're definitely keen to hear about your experience. Um, we'll start off with the basics. So for us, just explain what is foster care? Um, what is the difference between foster care and adopt and adopting? Uh, basically foster care is also known as out of home care. Basically. Foster care is when a child is unable to remain and live with his biological family for many, many reasons. So when the child is unable to stay with his biological family, he comes into the foster care system and then the agency or whoever is allocated this child will start to look for an acceptable home for this child to go to. Now, all depending on culture, religion, etc. We'll try to always match the child with the best appropriate foster carers. So therefore the carers are able to nurture, support and help this child grow. I'm going to refer to my phone because I've written some of oh, it. Um, basically foster carers take on 
the responsibility of a parent, of the biological parents to provide a child with a secure family environment. This may be until a child can return to their family or until a permanent placement can be found. Foster care. Being a foster carer is not a ordinary task. It is something quite different. To be able to get a phone call from your agency and say, hey, we have a child who needs a home, he's able to assist us and to be able to say, yeah, we can. In in a sense, we're your instant family. And when I say instant family, I remember particularly at a time where we had, my wife and I had one child in our care. And then subhanAllah, we got a phone call and saying, hey, we have another, excuse me, another child that needs a home, could you help us out? And then my wife and I looked at each other all like, yeah, okay, no worries. And then subhanAllah, about a week later, we get a phone call and there was this brother and sister that they wanted, they basically always try to keep siblings together. So they were talking to us and said, can you help us out? He's able to keep the brother and the sister together. Are you going to be okay? So knowing my wife and I were like, yeah, okay, no, let's don't bring him over. <laughs> and then subhanAllah, my wife and I would just look at each other. And then we had four kids under four years old. So subhanAllah, and uh, we, we think of subhanAllah, my wife and I, we always laugh about it and we talk about it and we look back. We're like, how, how did we do that? Like, how, how did we manage that? And then subhanAllah, it's, I say to the people in foster care, it is scary because it isn't a manic that you're taking and looking after this child. Like mm. it's a massive responsibility. Mm. But in saying that as well, you really, really need to have um tawakal in Allah. You really gotta put your trust in Allah as much as you can. You really gotta make your du'a and ask Allah to help you because you have your really good days and then you have your really bad days as well. I mean, our first daughter that came to us, our foster daughter that came to us. She never had a solid male in her life. So she was petrified of males. With my wife, they can do high fives, play, eat, or sleep. But if I came anywhere near her, so if I came from here to that table, her alarms would go up. She, her defense would go up. And then subhanAllah, I'm sitting there in my own home. I'm here and she's where you are. And we're sort of like giving each, each other the side eye and just looking and we're thinking, okay, okay. And then I, I remember the first couple of hours, we break the ice by, I poked my tongue out at her and then she poked her tongue out at me. And we both started laughing. And then subhanAllah, I reached out to our agency and I said, hey, what do I do? Well, what am I going to do? I mean, I, I, I can't feed her. My wife showers her. I don't get nowhere near that. My wife takes her to the bathroom. I can't tell her good night. I can't take her to bed. She doesn't want to be left with me alone. I can't do anything. Like, what do I do? Because I want to be able to help her. I want to be able to reinstate that safety and security of males in her mind. Mm. So back then, our, my manager said to me, I want, I'm going to give you a specific task and I want you to do it and don't let off on it. So I said to her, no problem. She goes, every single night when your wife takes her to bed, she goes, subhanAllah, go sit down in front of her bedroom outside in the corridor. Let her see you. Do not say a word. And then when your wife says good night to her and works out, walks out of the bedroom, you stand up and you walk away. And khalas, that's it. So subhanAllah, I did that day in. I did that for two weeks, two and, two, two and a half weeks. And then subhanAllah, one night I'm sitting there and I'm about to get up and walk away. And then she says to my wife, oh no, no, call Molly, call Molly. I want to hug him good night. And then I sort of buckled. Because I'm like, I looked at my wife and I'm like, what do I do? Like, Finally. Yeah. Because after so much um, patience and, and going through it, I was like, what do I do? Like, do, do, do I? She goes, you just got to do it. Like, just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. I walk in, I go, hi, how you going? Good, good. I go, yalla, yalla, happy week. It's time for bed. Did you say you could hand? Yep, all good, yep. Yalla, good night, good night. And then she came up, she put her arms, then she hugged me. She goes, good night. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. That's so beautiful. Hey. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I said to my wife, I, I don't know. I think I'm going to cry. I think I'm going to laugh. I don't know what to do. And then subhanAllah, I remember that same night, I actually called the manager and I said, guess what happened? She goes, what happened? She goes, she just hugged me. And she, she goes, all by herself. She, I got all by herself. I goes, it's, it's all good. SubhanAllah, it's just her. She goes, that's it. She goes, you just got to build 
that relationship and show her they're not all males are bad people. And she's starting to see that. Thank That's you. on a lot. Thank you so much for sharing. It shows the real human. This sort of uniform was Emma. I love Lissy going. Get straight into Amy. Amy. Um, it shows us the human aspect, the human side, and the the sort of the relationship building and the effect that it has on these children. Mm -hmm. Um, Sheikh, if you could just let us know. Of course, we all know the importance um in Islam, but sort of take us into the importance, but also the relevance for the community, the Sydney Muslim community. I mean, we hear these numbers now. Like, what is the the importance and for us as Muslims to be doing what Mama does really? <laughs> Firstly, it's just an amazing uh, uh, work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your family. Allahum ameen. Look, alhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Let me ask everyone here a question. What is the first thing that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did when he migrated to Mecca to Medina? Yalla. Do you have any any presents here? I've got, actually, I've got chocolates here. <laughs> got one. No, actually, they left in the car. Ah, oh, in the car. So, yeah, inshallah, you get your, uh, your present after the after bird, inshallah. <laughs> what was the first thing that Nabi Sallam did when he immigrated to Medina? You know, the first thing. Right? We know that, I'm going to help you, we know that he built, he built the masjid, right? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he did a lot of amazing, great things to establish the Muslim community. And what is the first thing that Nabi Sallam did to establish the first Muslim state, to, to establish the first uh, independent Muslim community, subhanAllah, in Medina? The Brotherhood. Establishing, yes, establishing the brotherhood, subhanAllah. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first thing he did is to establish the brotherhood and is to uh, connect the Muslim community together and basically to establish this uh, this ayah in the Quran, Inna ikhwa, indeed the believers are brothers and sisters. So and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his message is a message of unity, message of mercy, and also it's a message, it's, it's a message of uh, yani brotherhood, subhanAllah, and sisterhood. And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that has been narrated by an Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda that إنما تجد المؤمنين في توادهم وتراقمهم وتعاطفهم كمثل الجسد الواحد You know this, this amazing hadith that you find the, or the, 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 the believers in their mutual love, compassion and kindness towards one another is like that, it's like one body So Nabi sallam came to establish this one body the Ummah is one body, subhanAllah. If one limb, if, if, if a limb of this body suffers, all the Ummah, all the Ummah must feel this, suffer, this, this suffering, subhanAllah. And all the Ummah must stand to fulfill the, the needs of this, of this person uh, who is struggling or is facing any hardship. This is the beauty of the, the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why we know that the, 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 I'm, I'm yani starting with this foundation or with this introduction just to show you the importance of uh, thinking or the importance of believing that we are one one body, whether we are one body, the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallam, they'll say believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala as one God and Rasulullah Sallam as as the final messenger. We know the story. We know wa Mu'tasima. You know this is Mu'tasim Billah, one of the one of the Khalifa of Muslims in the in the Abbasi, in the Abbasi, uh, Abbasi uh, time. Uh, and Mu'tasim and Mu'tasim Billah. One day, a man came from Sidi Rawa in Amuria, this city in Turkey. A woman was, was dragged to be put in a jail by the Roman government. What are we going to do? We have to support it because she's, this woman keeps, keeps screaming in the market, Wa Mu'tasim, oh Mu'tasim, oh Mu'tasim, come and help me. So Al Mu'tasim said a letter to, this, uh, to, the, to, the, to the governor of this city, Amuria. And he said from Al Mu'tasim, Billah, Amir al Mu'minin, to, he mentioned a very abusive word, to Kalb al Rum. And he looked, we, if you, you know, if you would come to uh, be little or to, uh, you know, remove or to, you know, to take the dignity of a believer, of a Muslim, all Muslims have to stand. He said that, that this, this is a letter from Al Mu'tasim Billah to uh, this governor of the, the Romans, right? Release this woman, otherwise, I would prepare an army. The beginning of it would be at your city, and the, and the, and the end of it would be at my city. SubhanAllah, one, one woman, SubhanAllah, one woman, the Muslim community heard that, you know, the, 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 that she's struggling, all oh, the Muslim community must stand to, to support. This is the essence of Islam. This is the essence of Islam. So Muslim, Muslims cannot sleep or cannot rest knowing that there are some members of the community are struggling without offering help to them. This is that. This is the, this is the foundation that I wanted to start with. Now we come to 
the, the importance of taking care of the orphans and these vulnerable members of our community. Right? Sayyidina Musa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, ayna ajidu? Sayyidina Musa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Allah, O oh Allah, where can I find you? Where? Where can I find this connection with you? Qala ya Musa, ajiduni inda al-munkasirati qulubuhum. So you will find me with the, the vulnerable servants of mine. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, subhanAllah. And that's when, um, that's when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the, in, the, in the hadith that whoever relieve a hardship of a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve the hardships in the dunya and the akhirah. And whoever is, you know, the affairs of a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the affairs in the dunya and the akhirah. SubhanAllah. So this is, the, this is the beauty of Islam, subhanAllah. Islam, Islam wants us to be one body. One body. If one limb, if, if, if a limb of the body suffers, all the body, all the body would respond to this with uh, walkfulness and and fever as a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi in the Hadith. So what is the importance of taking care of them, the, 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 the vulnerable members of our community? Be extremely important. Why? Because that completes our Iman. That completes our Iman and that till that uh, completes the message that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with. That you would never find in a Muslim community, in the Muslim community, whether with Muslims or even with those who live with Muslims. If you are not Muslims, you will never find any of them, anyone who is struggling, who is in need. The boy that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, has commanded us to take care of our neighbors to the seventh neighbor. Not only you, you, the seventh neighbor, also to make sure that and whoever believes in Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the day of Jalib, as the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that the one who believes in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la would never sleep knowing that his neighbor is in need for anything. How about seeing these children, our, our kids, they are our kids. who may be put in you know, with non-Muslim families at risk of losing their identity and their religion. Now we're not talking about, you know, uh, you know, financial hardship. We're not talking about, you know, food or water. We're talking about losing Islam. And this is the reality, subhanAllah, losing Islam. Alhamdulillah, as the Muslim community in Australia, we are establishing ourselves now. And there is, alhamdulillah, a huge progress, a huge progress, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But, subhanAllah, we need to be aware of where to put our money, where to put our fund our, and our support. Because SubhanAllah, we spend a lot of money, a lot of money, millions of dollars on amazing projects. But when you look at, when you look at the project that we are, you know, you know putting, uh, you know, a focus on, right? And the other gaps in our community that we need to fill, you would say to, to you know, you would, you would say to yourself, like, why? Why would we put these millions of dollars, for example, in building, in decorating masajid, right? Whereas we have at the same time kids, we cannot find families to take care of them. And again, to take care of their identity before anything else. So we have to be very vigilant, very aware of where, where we put our, our support and our money. It's not about donate, donate, you know, donate, brother, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, and you donate. And subhanAllah, in the last five or six years, more than 250 million dollars have been, have been donated by the Muslim community in Australia. Alhamdulillah, we are a very generous community, but we have to be very, we have to put priorities. And I would say, and I will inshallah end with this, I would say that taking care of our kids who did not have families to take care of them is one of the main priorities that we have uh, or that we should have in our, yani in, in, the, in, the, in the Muslim community, fulfilling their needs, taking care of them, making sure that they are raised in such a, an Islamic and in a safe environment is a fardu kufaya. And I want to end with this. Sorry. What is Fardu Kifaya? The communal huh? obligation. But I want, to, I want someone to, to, you know, to explain what's Fardu Kifaya. Well, what is the legal of communal obligation? Huh? It was both spelled in the entire community. So the Alam of Allah Ta'ala would say, Fardu Kifaya, Al Kifaya Huna, or well, the, the community here, or the, the, the people that we're referring to, are the people, the people that are enough, the, the people that are enough to fulfill this gap or to fill this need, enough. So talking about, for example, some of the community will get up and, and when, no, 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 we're talking about enough people to fill this gap, I would say, oh, alhamdulillah, this is the public value has been, has been, has been fulfilled. Otherwise, all the ummah will be asked. So this is the importance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and why is it to, to use us in saving and in supporting the vulnerable members of our community, especially those who have lost their families, those who cannot uh, find a safe home 
to uh, uh, to uh, to have them. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I just want to um, follow up on that because obviously now it's very clear about the importance in the religion uh, of looking after the vulnerable family, uh, sorry, vulnerable children, and just vulnerable people in children. Um, the next question is a common question that comes up because even though we know that a lot of people will use Islam as a reason to sort of discuss barriers with fostering. Um, so I want to know just generally what are the FIP rules about being foster carer? Specifically what I have in mind, that's a common question that comes up is the issue of maharams. Obviously, if you're looking after a child, that's fine. But a lot of times people will say, well, if it's a child that's obviously a teenager, it becomes difficult to look after teenagers. So yeah. what is the rulings on that? And of course, um, how, how, how to navigate that as well? Yeah, it's, it's always a challenge, right? It's a challenge that, we, uh, that we're facing now. Uh, let me start with uh, saying that no adoption in Islam. So Islam came to forbid adoption, right? And the meaning of adoption is when you uh, consider a, uh, a strange kids as one of you, as one of your kids, uh, as one of your you know biological kids, and you share your inheritance with them and one of them, the worth of them and rest with them. So there's no no adoption in Islam, and and we and then the the, the end the end of this period in Islam was the the was the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed. ألم قد زيد منها وطرا ذو زنكة زيد زيد بن زيد بن حارس رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاه was adopted by رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم in the in the early in the early times of Islam right and even to the point that the people would would call him زيد بن محمد زيد سانف محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم is how close he was to رسول الله and the best best to consider him as as his own son صلى الله عليه محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم and then Allah سبحانه وتعالى and then Allah سبحانه وتعالى revealed this ayah to رسول الله قول محمد no, no, no more adoption in Islam. And the meaning of adoption here, and we have two, two terminologies: to adopt a kid or to sponsor a kid. We have two, we have two, two different terminologies here. Adoption is haram in Islam, but sponsoring and fostering, and taking care of orphans or the vulnerable members of our community is highly recommended in Islam. What's adoption again? Adoption is when you consider a a, a strange kids. That's not your kids. That's not your 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 your, your, your biological kids as your kid and you give him from your inheritance to treat him as one of your uh, family one of you one of you one of your kids in uh, you know uh, from blood in blood so can we sponsor yes of course can we sponsor force and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said ana wa kafir al yatim our kafara here means the mean meaning is sponsoring ana wa kafir al yatim fi al jannati kaitayt and i with the person who sponsor an orphan right in general like this he said, not this, Then it will be very close to, to Rasulullah in Jannah, indicating to you the greatness of the deed, of the amal that they, that, they, that they have done. So, how can we sponsor a kid? Sponsor them financially, taking care of them, uh, taking care of the education, taking care of the religion, taking care of the, look, everything, right? We fulfill all the needs. But here, we would face a challenge. And the challenge is, when these kids reach the age of puberty, it's a challenge now. When the kids reach the age of puberty, we cannot, we, we can no longer have them or be with them in one house without a mahram. And if, and if, and since since it's hard to, to find a mahram, in this case we say we would we would need to find a shelter, a safe home for them. Oh, can how, how can we fix this issue? Practically, we say that Islam, Islam. Establishes a, 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 a the um, you know the close relationships we have right are are on on, you know, on on different categories. One of one of the categories is a relationship in blood, which is your 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 relatives or your uh, your family in blood or in milk. So having blood and milk. So for example, your 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 family in blood, which means that your uh, biological mother or father or, or siblings, right? Or cousins and uncles, or in milk, in milk, which, which which means when the when a mother breastfeeds a a son or a, 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 a baby, this baby becomes becomes her child, exactly like her child, and also will be the child of a husband, and it will be, it will be treated Islamically as we treat our our own biological biological kids. So we have to we have to so the prac one of the practical ways to overcome this challenge in an early stage is when Khalas we said no adoption anymore in Islam, but we say that we sponsor, we take we, we take care of and we uh, uh, we support, right? 
And if a if someone wants to foster a kid and you know wants them to stay with them permanently, what are we gonna do? The easiest way is if, if she can breastfeed him with course milk. The milk has to be there. If if she can breastfeed him with milk, and I would say we would go with even once. Should I said five times? I would say even once. If you can breastfeed him with one 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 full meal of milk, this this child will become the child of the mother of the of the, of the sister and also of uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, her husband as well. But in terms of adoption, which is uh, recorded in Islam at Tabani, and Islam has forbidden this. I hope to say I could put food for you. Know, thank you for yeah. the clarification. I'm also interested to hear, obviously, from Muhammad of how you navigate this as a. Um, it's a it is, I know. Yeah. 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 And I remember we had a previous discussion where you explained there that there actually is no more closed adoption in yeah. Australia anymore. So that, yeah, we don't have to sort of. That's not a thing the Muslims have to navigate here in Australia anyway. Um, but how have you navigated, um, obviously, open adoption? How have you and your wife found the process? Um, because obviously the next most common question that we're going to get from everyone is what's the process like? Where do you start from? Um, who comes out to you? Who do you call? So please tell us what does that process look like? So the whole process for my wife and I, subhanAllah, started one day we were just sitting at home and then we get a phone call that there was a this little boy, um, eight, eight months old, eight months old. So we needed a long-term home. So of course, well, I've known Mr. and Mrs. Yes. <laughs> yep, no worries. Bring this is your favorite word. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Subhanallah, we just went through a, a time in our lives where no, nah, it's not enough what we're doing. No, it's not enough what we're doing. More kids, no, it's not enough. Subhanallah. So, Subhanallah, naturally, yes, the child came. And Subhanallah, we started raising him. And then we had uh, a meeting with the biological mother who sat down and just looked at me, plain and simply, and said, I'm unable to look after him like the way you and your wife will. Wow. And I'm happy for you guys to adopt him if you can. And at that point, I didn't know much about adoption. So I did my research and, reached and looked into it heaps and we went through the process. This is the case manager? Myself and the case manager. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what we ended up coming to was the child, the child's surname remains under his biological father, who yeah. I'm in contact with still. The child, my son, will not inherit from me, but I'm going to leave him a little gift. So a little present. Um, Sorry, I forgot to add that can we give uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, kids something from our inheritance, from our wealth? And Islam has put a very, a very very amazing rule in Subhanallah. Islam said that you can give them up to third of your wealth. You can give them up to third of the wealth, and we call it al-wasiyah, al-wasiyah al-wajib. And this will say, subhanAllah, should be a way, should, this will say is to be paid from the wealth of the descendant before even they distribute the, the, the inheritance, subhanAllah. And we know that from the hadith of Sayyid Nabi Waqas, with Allah Ta'ala Anu Warda, and the Nabi Sallallahu said to him, Athulufu wa thulufu kathir. So the third is the, is the maximum that you can give out to, to anyone other than your kids, and uh, Allah, yeah. Allah bless you, reward you. Um, and then subhanAllah, um, so my wife and I were talking and we're like, okay, he'll remain under his biological family. Ties to his family will not, are not severed. So I'm in contact with his biological father, his grandfather. My wife speaks to his biological mother and their family. We all talk to each other. Um, and then my wife and I basically got to the point where the mushroom issue came up. Okay, we can do this now, but subhanAllah, when he grows up, what do we do? And then subhanAllah, we kept, we kept hitting um, brick walls in regards to giving some answers. And it's one night my wife and I were just sitting and I looked at my wife and I go, we've had him since he was eight months old. And he is a lie, Ashna, inshallah, and we see him grow up. Yani, is it going to bother us that much if you have to wear a scarf or whatnot on that? I go, is it, Yanni, is it going to be that much? I mean, our love for our child, there's no limitations to it. This one my wife goes, turned around to me, she goes, no, and she goes, if I have to wear a hijab, I'll wear a hijab. Allah. She goes, we're always together anyway. I mean, we go out as a family, we come together as a family, we're home together, and then they go to school and et cetera, et cetera. So there's no really time where they're by themselves. So my wife and I said to ourselves, if we got to that point where we were stuck on the mahram issue, that's how we would work it, where we would ensure that we're always together. We go together and we come together. So therefore, we're not breaking any rules, inshallah. Inshallah. And then subhanAllah, 
did some more research around the, and the whole Mahara mission that we found some of the breastfeeding and how if my wife can produce milk, give him, um, at that time we read there was five full feeds, but now we, even if we can just do one or two, then subhanAllah, he becomes a Mahara. So we looked into that and we followed that practice, alhamdulillah. And then subhanAllah, once we got to that point, we reached out to our case manager and we had a meeting and we said, look, this is the road we wish to take. We're in the, we, us and the biological family want this to happen. So inshallah, let's just start the process. And then subhanAllah, we went through the process of basically doing our paperwork. So for example, like we're doing the same thing now with our, my foster daughter. And subhanAllah, we're just doing the, some of the adoption paperwork now at home where basically have to put down all of our details, who lives with you at home, do all your national police checks, all your um, working with children's checks, uh, financial uh, financial details. So where are we at financially? Because at the same time, we're fostering, you're getting an allowance to look after a child adoption. You're most likely, it's basically in, when you adopt, the agency and the system is saying, okay, khalas, do your child, you look after them now and you go from there. You don't need us. So subhanAllah, you go through all the paperwork and then medical, you do a quick medical to make sure you're in good health, inshallah. And then you get your referrals and then you just start the process. And then from there, you got about six to eight weeks to get that done, inshallah. And then from there, you get allocated an assessor who will come down and sit with you at home and they start having discussions. How are you like this? How? Just a whole heap of questions. They're basically getting to know you because then they're going to basically put the paperwork together so they can give they can give it to the DCJ and give it to the judge to read what, if they're happy with everything. Now, through the entire process, with, when we were going through the process with my son, the assessor, she sat with my wife and I and just watched us, how we were with the kids. Then she sat with us individually in the backyard, having discussions, getting to know us, and just basically seeing who we are and seeing if we are able and capable of looking after this kid for the rest of his life. And alhamdulillah, after that we went through the process, they deemed us to be capable and we got the approval, alhamdulillah, to adopt. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So just uh, all of how long was that process? Our process took us approximately two years. Oh, wow. From start to finish. Okay. But that's, so even, it, it, yeah. it's, it's, when I say two years, people also need to understand, it's two years, but then it's the rest of your life. Yeah, and then it's a small price to to pay, in, so to speak, to go through the process. But inshallah, khalas, you know, for the rest of your life. It's a lifetime project, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's a lifetime. It, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and see, the thing is where people get mixed up is when we, I got asked the question one day from the, the legal team for the um, DCJ and they called me up and they said, okay, in regards to his name, do you want to hyphen your surname? Do you want to remove his surname? What do you want to do? I go, no. I go, he stays under his biological family. I go, he will always be whoever he is. And I'm just the we're looking after. Yeah. So basically, in a sense, we're just removing the legal responsibilities yeah. and putting the, and passing them on to my wife and I. So basically, the, the, the state is saying, the responsibility is no longer the sheikh, the responsibility is now the mom. But in order to get to that process, and it needs to be understood that it's not an easy process. It's not, oh, fill in a few paperwork, here we go, yalla, I made us. No, it's a very lengthy process. You, you know, we, you need to make sure that, and they want to make sure, and the judge and the system needs to be satisfied that you are really capable of looking after it. Not just now, and like, alhamdulillah, alameen. 20 years time when we're a lot older, they also think about that. How are you going to be, how you, what are your capabilities? Are there any health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if there are any health issues, it's not a deal breaker, but it also means that we'll, they'll need to dive in a bit deeper and see what support they can provide you with and what else they can do to make, to make it somewhat easier on you in the long run. So, so part of Sorry, just to yeah. clarify, during that two year process, are you looking after this? Yeah, yeah, he's, okay. yeah, so he still remains in your care. Everything is as per normal. Contacts with family is still going on per normal, going to school. Everything is normal. It's just in the background, the cool. legal paperwork is all starting to happen mm. and all starting to get fall, filled in. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, subhanAllah, once you go through that process and they hand the paperwork over to the judge to read over it, then you just got to wait for a phone call. And then 
Subhanallah, I remember I was. It's 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 a very the most special phone call. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> so, it was. It was the most. It was the most special phone call, most precious phone call I've ever waited for in my entire life. But at the same time, it was the most stressful time of my entire life. I mean, as a hobby, I like to do a lot of woodworking. And for about a good week and a half, I spent a lot of time in my garage just doing woodworking just to keep myself busy because it's true, it's true. I started to think, well, what about this? Did I did I dot every single I? Did I cross every T? Did we do everything right? Did we do this right? Is that right? Ya Allah, Ya Allah, please help me. And then... I started to settle myself down and just halas, kept myself busy. And then I remember I was moving a piece of timber. And then I looked at my phone and it was ringing. And I go, hello. And he, she goes, and it was the lady who was looking after my case. She goes, how are you going? I go, I'm um, good. Um, <laughs> what's up? She goes, oh, no, I think not much. She goes, um, are you sitting down? I'm like, um, no, I'm standing up, but what's up? I'm like, what's going on? Go sit down. She goes, yeah. She goes, look, I'm just here to give you some awesome news. And this, and she goes, the judge reads through your entire file and he's happy to make uh, an order. MashaAllah. And well, would you like to come down? I go, to, um, just give me a sec. And then I'm like, just standing there in my garage. And I reeled out to my... Triple hand. Yes, I'm sure. He... I didn't know how to speak. I didn't know what to do. So I didn't know what to do. And then I, 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 I go, yeah, just, just speak, speak. I got, she goes, I'll give you guys a call back. So let me call you back in 10 minutes. So you and your wife can just, you know, get yourself. Yeah. yeah. I hold the wife. I go, they're going to make an order. I go, well, well, we're going to do it, inshallah. And at that time, adoption wasn't really heard of, especially in the Muslim community. And I believe I was one of, only a handful of that. Yeah. yeah, one of the yep. first few that I don't. Yep. So then, as you can imagine, legal team called back. Yeah, when do you want to come? We've got these three dates. I got the, the first date, whatever date, give me a date. So she called me, I think, she called me on a Thursday and they had an opening in court on the Monday. And I said the Monday. And she goes, done, that's it. I'll see you there. All good. And then my wife and I were just, I think we were just high-fiving, hugging, crying, couldn't believe it. The kids are coming out oh, because they want us. We're going to do it, but we're going to... There's so much going on. And I remember calling my case manager who who stuck by us for everything, who helped us and guided us for everything. I, I mean, I can't thank her enough. I mean, honestly, truly, I'm an amazing soul. SubhanAllah, you know. And I remember calling her and telling her, and I go, guess what? Guess what's up? I go, they just called me and said that they're going to make an order. Amazing <laughs> soul, man, mashallah. I would love to see any family, Allah. We are in. And Allah, she started crying. And we're all just crying. And then, subhanAllah, we just then started to get things organized because we were, had to start getting things done. Mm. I'm sorry. Please. Oh, alhamdulillah. And then, yeah, yeah, we're gonna say, Mashallah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, everyone, but I'm really living it. Yeah. And what's yeah. what's his name? Uh, Zayn. Zayn. Ah, oh, what a beautiful name, Mashallah. And so we get everything ready, and it's finally on Monday came, and my wife and I didn't sleep the day before, so we're waking up and. I look like a satyar and all the bags. I'm like, oh my God, I'm putting my suit on. I'm like, oh, let's go. We're going on the train. And, and subhanAllah, we dressed our kids in suits and ties and nice clothes and we went down. And then we went through the process. Judge came in and started talking about it. And then we got to a point where the judge turned around and said, well, okay, now I'm going to start making the orders where we're going to now pass on all the legal side of it to yourself and your wife and I broke down where wow. I, I, I I couldn't get myself together anymore <laughs> and I it, I think the judge was getting the most everyone I don't think there was a dry eye in, in the courtroom and going through the process and then at the end of it after the judge made the order and and congratulated us the judge went out of the court and then it was just my wife and I and the people that were with us then I remember my wife just grabbing me and I just broke down. I just broke down and couldn't stop crying because I couldn't believe that we've gone through the process. It's happened. And subhanAllah, 
the reason why it, it meant a great deal to my wife and I is because my wife and I aren't able to have our own biological children. So it was always this thing that we didn't have between us. And then subhanAllah, to be able to go through the process, because we weren't able to have our own kids of our own, we thought, you know what, we'll go into foster care. And subhanAllah, even getting into foster care, that story, I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> so it's a Sunday afternoon, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching the footy. We go, we use pool. It was between Bulldogs and Parramatta. I don't say supporting Bulldogs. <laughs> this season they bring the, the, the Orwell, this thing. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to, we don't want to say anything more. <laughs> so subhanAllah, I'm sitting there and I'm watching the footy and my wife comes up to me. She goes, hey, your sister's inviting us to a charity dinner tonight. She goes, yeah, Allah, she wants to talk to you. Leave me alone, man. I'm watching the footy. Khalas, I'm, you know, khalas, just leave me alone. I'm watching the footy. She goes, and my sister heard what I said. She goes, put him on the phone. Put him on the phone. And this is my oldest sister. So, oh, my God, God I'm going to cop that. I let that sit. I let that back. Yeah. <laughs> so I get on the phone. So I go, she's going good. She says, listen, I bought you tickets. You're coming. That's it. Maldi snashi. Yalla, so I go, I go, I go. And that's how we went to this um, charity talk that was about uh, fostering. And then we sat there and just listening to people's stories and how it was happening. And we didn't know this thing existed. And it's hard. At the end of the night, my wife and I were just driving back home. And then we looked at each other and I said to my wife, look, this is obviously a very, very big thing to do. On the count of three, we either say yes or no, or khalas. If it's a yes, inshallah, we'll take it Allah and we do it. If we say no, then khalas. It's, it is what it is. And subhanAllah, we, we counted to three and we both said yes. And subhanAllah, that was almost 10 years ago. And that was a good decision. One, two, three, yes. <laughs> like, <of> course, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> because we, we wanted... I wanted to make sure that my wife was okay with this. And my wife wanted to make sure that I was okay with this because, and I say this to people, I didn't get into foster care to fill the things that were missing in my life. No, we got into foster care because my wife and I were in a part of our lives where, alhamdulillah, we wanted to give back. We wanted, we said, well, okay, you know, as Allah hasn't written for us in our life that we're going to have our own, then you know what? We can help. We can do more. We can help. We can reach out. And then subhanAllah, we just went through it and we just haven't stopped since then. I mean, to the point so much that my wife and I got to a point where we were so frustrated with seeing kids constantly come and go with just a, all their belongings in a plastic bag that my wife wanted opened up and I and I helped her out, opening up my own charity dedicated to helping um, kids, Muslim kids, foster in our ulama. So basically, we were tired and we didn't, we knew it wasn't right. We were tired of seeing children come to us from wherever they were with just plastic bag and like, that's not right. I mean, that's your whole life. So when a child gets moved from A to B, basically they pack up, he's, they're packing up their stuff in a garbage bag and they take it and they go to the next town. That's, that, that didn't sit well. Yes, we were. It didn't sit well with us. Like, that's not right. I mean, then my wife, subhanAllah, as soon as a child would come, my wife and I would go straight to the shops start buying up everything, get them whatever they need, get a suitcase, get everything. Because we wanted them to have that for them forever. I mean, subhanAllah, I remember where we once put a room together for our foster daughter. And I remember she turned around to my wife and I and said, oh, is this for me? We go, yeah. She goes, the bed? We go, yeah. She goes, the pillow? Yeah, yeah. I said to her, listen, I can see everything. I can see from the ceiling to the floor to the walls. It's all yours. Everything here is for you. Whether you stay with us for one day or whether you stay with us forever, it will always be for you. I want you to have them. They're a present from my wife and I to you. And subhanAllah, the things that we take for granted, toys that we wouldn't would probably throw out after six months because our kids give birth, they were amazing things to her. They were like, oh my God, a Barbie, a this, a truck, this, bit pillows. Like, and then it sort of hit me and I sort of looked at my wife and thought, okay, yeah, you know, we, we, we got to do more. I mean, if a child's sitting there saying to us, is this mine? Can I have this? Is this that? Then obviously they've never had that in their life. I mean, it's beautiful. SubhanAllah. And there was another time that sticks out where we, we through our charity that we, through the charity, we had Eid al Fatah. So we decided within the board members that we would do aid gifts for Muslim kids in the foster care system. And when we distributed the gifts out, I remember the case manager 
sat to us and called us and said, we just literally gave them the bag and they're freaking out. They, they never, ever, they can't believe that they have all these things for them. I know. And it's just to show you that the smallest things that we wouldn't even worry about, to them, it's it's huge. Oh, well. A lot of this is to be, to be this. You know, one of, one of the things that I, that I, you know, it's hard to be, to be pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may put us, may put us through certain, you know, circumstances to test us. Mm. You guys accept that, has accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree Humble. and actually has decided to be, to be positive and to give, to, and to give back. And subhanAllah, the beautiful hadith of Rasulullah sallam that, uh, so show mercy, show mercy to the people, you know, of, 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 of earth. So the, so the God subhanahu wa ta'ala would show mercy upon you, will show you this mercy. So subhanAllah, this beautiful and amazing uh, rahmah in, the, in, in, in your hearts can be a ticket to Jannah. Mm. Wallahi subhanAllah, and I know this, you're, put, you're putting a lot of, a lot of uh, efforts and sacrifices and whatnot, but this rahmah in your heart can be a ticket to Jannah, and we know that subhanAllah, the, the prostitute that gave water to the, the dog, mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَفَقَرَ اللَّهُ لَهَا فَغَفَرَ لَهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with what she did, and uh, يعني, uh, put her in Jannah, subhanAllah. What about the one he showed, he shows mercy, to one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's oh. gracious human being. May Allah rewards you and congratulations, inshallah. Thank you. Jannah, bi'ithni Allah, rabbi al-azim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ta'ala to meet Jannah. Inshallah. By his will, grace, and, 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 and mercy, Allah. Okay. And we are going to go on a break soon, but I just wanted to ask, I mean, you've touched on, both of you have touched on it in your um, comments, but where can, what resources are out there for families who maybe aren't, are interested, but don't really want to go into that step of going into foster care? Like how else can they contribute? Um, what sort of companies, where can they start and things like that? And there's just, for, I've always said to people, if you aren't sure, you can get in touch with us and we can direct you to multiple agencies that are out there. And even if you're, hello, it's because foster care is a big thing. People are always going to be a bit reserved in regards to what they do. Yeah. The one thing I say to a lot of people, and I say this tonight and share a lot is just have the confidence. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm not asking you to take a trial. I'm not yeah, asking. One, two, three. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, <thank God. laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I am asking everyone just to have that conversation. Start reaching out to people. There are agencies out there through Southwest Sydney and all areas where you can reach out. There are Muslim kids that are currently in care. There are Muslim kids currently that are not with Muslim carers. So we need to tell people that. The support is out there. There is information out there. If you're unsure, then inshallah, we can just, I mean, just do what I did. But sorry, that was an important point that we didn't. And the reason that they're not in, because the way I understand it is the first priority for Muslim children, of course, would be Muslim foster carers. But the issue is that there aren't enough Muslim foster carers. Yeah. So that's... And, and I mean, subhanAllah, I was having a discussion today and I said, subhanAllah, you look at our religion, the fastest growing religion in the world. But yet we still struggle to put Muslim foster kids with Muslim carers. And, and it's a big, it's a big issue. I, I mean, how, how could we, it, it, it just blows my mind. Like how could, how are we at this point where I'm speaking to my case manager and she's telling me we got no one. So we're going to have to actually look to non carers. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, well, like, even the non-Muslim carers, they're beautiful people. They're amazing people who are open in their hearts and will do their best. But you need to also understand that the, what, the story that really got to me was this. There was a child who was in, a foster child who was in care. They looked everywhere around to find the Muslim carers. Couldn't find it. Find it. Hold on, there was this old lady, a non-Muslim, who put her hand up and said, you know what, bring him, I'll look after him. So subhanAllah, she went and took him in and she did her best. You know, she reached out to local Imams, like all masjids, trying to get a benefit from it. Can I get a good hand? Can I get this for him? Can I get that? And he could see that. And then one day he turns around to her, to his carer. And he says to her, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. And then she just looks at him. She goes, sorry, sorry, like, sorry. I guess what? Well, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. She goes to him, why? He goes to her, I just don't. She goes, well, look. She goes, before we do anything else, let me... Get someone that can talk to you and we'll get you a bit of help. So subhanAllah, she reached out to a 
to a person within the community, I think a sheikh or so. And the sheikh came and started to talk to him. And the sheikh asked him, you know, he said she didn't want to be a Muslim. Can I ask why? He goes to him, yeah. He goes to him, as big as our community is, when my deep, my, my, my most difficult time of my life, there was not one Muslim who put his hand up and said, come to me, I'll help you. But yet there were non-Muslims who said, come, I'll help you. Why would I want to be with you guys? And it's oh, the shaft just broke down, as you can imagine. So we need to get Muslim carers in. And I understand that it's a difficult process. And I know it's very confronting. And I know it's scary. And it is. I'm not going to lie to you guys. There are difficult times. It does get serious, it's scary sometimes. There are going to be days where you're not going to want to know what to do. I mean, one of the girls that we had in our care used to wake up in the middle of the night screaming and shouting because she's having, she's had so much trauma in her. She used to scream and shout. My wife used to run in there with the Quran and start reading Quran over, over, over. Over a period of time, alhamdulillah, she started to settle down. But she still had those nightmares. Kids have been through a lot. But we have to try. And I know it's very, it's not an easy thing to say, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and be a foster care. But all I'm saying tonight is, please have a conversation. Just have a conversation. No one's asking. Don't tell us your name. Don't tell us nothing. Just have the conversation, get a bit of information, and then see how you go. Again, as long as you are within the fra within the framework, mm. within the the boundaries that Islam has put, you are inshallah you are in, in a safe. Uh, you are safe. Alhamdulillah, from any haram, from anything. Alhamdulillah. And again, Allah the and taking care of these kids, getting these kids on uh, under UK uh, early is you know is is uh, or oh, the early the, the the earlier it is, the better for you, inshallah. Why? Because you can at least. You know, breastfeed them. You can take care of them and stuff. So we have a lot of kids, you know, before the, you know, so under two, who, subhanAllah, they basically have have, mm. uh, have have no one. So I think um, lack of awareness. This is this is basically what we have. Mm. We are not we are not fully aware of the implications of leaving the, ki the these kids to go uh, away from us, right? And uh, again, one of the implications is them losing the deen forever. Subhanallah. And we talk about them and their lineage. If you're gonna save them, if you're gonna save their their, their religion, them and their offspring until the environment will be a new scale, will be the whole new scale. Subhanallah, because if you, you because you are the one, you are the means to save the the religion. Subhanallah. So it's a highly highly recommended, uh, I would say, ibadah. Yeah. Right. Most definitely. It's hard with the ibadah just to, to to make sure that our kids are, are safe in 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 safe hands. Subhanallah. Okay. <laughs> to the both of you and um, we are just going to go on a no we're not going to go on a break okay we are going on a break uh we're not we back <laughs> um and we'll come back for a q a um session um the right break is about 20 minutes i think 10 minutes okay so please be back exactly 10 minutes okay so just quickly we've got with us now um someone who is actually the president of fostering our umma um what i'd like to do is go straight to you there are Quite a number of questions coming. They're still coming in. Um, but we were just having a chat about the barriers of foster care. And I knew you wanted to just quickly touch on that as well. Because yeah. there are some specific challenges just now we were talking about in the break. Could you please um, touch on that? Yeah. So as beautiful and rewarding fostering is, it's also, there. look, and I always try to be honest as much as I can. And the people that know me really well know this story because I don't really talk about it much because... It, it was very difficult for my wife and I to process what happened. So we have, we received a call about a, a child who's coming into care. He was eight days old. And he, baby, literally he was that big, subhanAllah. Hi, we got a kid here. Yes, yes, you know, normal standard. He said, yes, again. subhanAllah. <laughs> so we get him, so subhanAllah, I came back from work and my, and my wife goes, okay, I'm going to go straight to the shop, grab a few things. His bassinet's ready if when they come. Just we'll put him in the bassinet and then inshallah we'll organize everything as we go. So subhanAllah, through the time we organized it and then with this child, we watched him hit all his milestones, raised him until he was three and a half years old. As you can imagine, as you can imagine, raising a child, you can't help but feel attached to it. And it's it's not easy when you get told, Hey, this child is now gonna go back to his family. They've looked into it. They've provided help for the family. 
and this child now is going to go back home. Now, with this particular child, Bismillah Al-Wul, he was very, very active, very full on. And just his case in general, there was a lot of um, curveballs that happened that we were involved in. So, in in a sense, my wife and I, we seen him as our own. And then when we got told that he was going to leave our care, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie, it was a very, very difficult time for my wife and I. And we didn't know how to process that. Like, how do you process... A baby that came at eight days old, but three and a half years later, you're being told, okay, now they're going to go back to his family. Now, Alhamdulillah, we were happy because now this is another trial that my wife and I said that, you know what, we helped him, we raised him, now he's going back to his family. Inshallah, he has a beautiful and prosperous life with his family. But at the same time, we were upset and it was very hard on us to process that and all we are about to let go of a child that we don't want to let go of. I mean, we never want to let go of any children. We've helped, oh, I think, three or four children that were in our care go back to their biological family, which was and absolutely beautiful things. I mean, in foster care, we always need to remember the main aim, yeah, whenever we can, is to try to get these children back home, back to their families. That is the utmost aim. The aim is not to take them away from their family and keep them away from their family. No. There are processes and procedures in place that the agencies will work with the families and try to help them and in seeing what they can do to get the family going. Now, after all this information is gathered, a decision will be made in regards to what is in the best interest for this child. If the, if the biological family is capable and have fixed themselves and have done whatever they needed to do to be able to put their hand up and say we're ready to take our child back then inshallah this is a process that that's put in place if not then that's when we look at permanent uh, permanent placency so we, i just want everyone to be mindful that while all of the stories i'm telling you guys and my experiences are a bit all over the place there are going to be difficult times and days are difficult times when you have to say goodbye but i like I always say to my wife i always say to my wife we're never really saying goodbye to them because at the end of the day, they're always going to be in our hearts. Because Hollis, we will we'll always know that in one way or another, we had something to play in this child's life and we helped them grow up and give them the little kickstart that they need. And then Hollis, now they've, they're flourishing on their own. So I want everyone just to be mindful that fostering is a absolute beautiful thing, but it does come with its challenges. But there is support, and I want to make sure that everyone understands that you're not, you don't get, because I had someone tell me, what, did they just come give you a kid and just leave it, and that's it, see you later? I'm like, no, no, no. Because <laughs> a lot of people have to think, well, okay, there's a child in care now, we're going to call someone, they come put them, see you later. No, no, no. There's an other door off the house, you're not from the house, and yeah, you know, <laughs> see you later, boy. No. <laughs> so when the child comes into care, You'll sit down with your case manager and they'll talk to you and they'll see if there's anything that they can do to assist you in the in the transition process. Mm. And then after you go, the transition plan has taken place and that everyone has set, things have settled, every month or so, the, the case manager will come and see how everything is going, have a chat with the carers and the child, if the child's able to talk and just see what everything is going. So if there is any support, and I say support because I was struggling at a time. I mean, the story about the little girl I was telling you about, I didn't know what to do. Oh, well, Lohi, I had no idea. What are you supposed to do? You can't go next to a child, but you're in your own home. You're in your own home, but you can't walk into the kitchen if she's there. You can't go to your bedroom because you got to walk past her room, and if she's in her room, there are challenges. And that's why, subhanAllah, I say to a lot of people in foster care and foster carers reach out. There's so much help out there. There are so many training courses that you can do. And my wife and I have done many. And subhanAllah, when you start to learn about the behaviors of a child, why is a child behaving this way? Why is a child doing this child? Like? And then one particular moment that we were doing the trauma training and they showed us two photos of a three-year-old brain. One child had experienced trauma and the other had it. The child that experienced trauma, his brain size was, yeah, about that big or so. And the normal brain size of a child who didn't experience trauma was about that big. It was actually neglect. Ne sorry, neglect. Neglect, yeah. yeah. So just simply neglect, it, it's, it affects children, subhanAllah. So 
there is many support networks out there that can help and you need to reach out and and, and look we're not my wife and I we do have our bad days and we're you know we're tired we're exhausted we don't know what to do and it's that's when you can reach out to your family you know I mean we'll should reach out to her family I'll reach out to my family we'll get people to come help us we got to a point where we were looking after uh, the four under four where I said to my sisters I just want to sleep for 20 minutes without anyone knocking on my door without hearing a baby cry I, go, I love them to death and I don't want to stop but please can I all the please give me just sleep for 20 minutes okay give me that 20 minutes I'll give you 23 hours for the day no problem but I need to because I need to just get that help and it's a lot of the amount of support they came so I had my family all rock up then I had all my wife's family rock up everyone was coming our friends were coming like I'm I want to sleep but you know, <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now <laughs> so if you want that I'm going to do it so it's a lot of how it works but support networks are very important to have and there is support out there inshallah so just wanted to let everyone know I just wanted to add as well um the child doesn't like come in and is like, oh, thank you so much for giving me this home and looking after me. And you guys are amazing. They are usually petrified and they always say there's like a honeymoon stage. So, so the first couple of weeks, they'll be so good and they'll say yes and no, and they'll be so polite. And then as they get comfortable, you'll see because how don't kids that have gone through trauma, that have gone through neglect, um, domestic violence, there's a lot of behaviors that will come up with that. So you just have to be like mindful and patient that all that is going to come up as well. Um, but like my husband was saying, there is training, like trauma training and lots of different things that um, the agencies put out there as well. Mm. Yeah. And and bear in mind that you will see some behaviours and you think, what's going on? I mean, we knew of children, because they weren't being fed properly or weren't being fed once a day, they used to hide food. So they would go, steal food from their own home and go hide it in their bedroom because they didn't know when their next food was going to be. They didn't know when they were going to eat next. So subhanAllah, even a child at that young age, in their own mind, started to build survival, survival mode. Yeah, subhanAllah. So you've seen many things, subhanAllah, but you just got to be patient. You got to have the patience and just try to do as best as you can. And the good news is that one of the scholars say, Ya Bunay, in Allah, إِذَا كَلَّفَكَ فَقَدْ كَفَلَبِكَ and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a responsibility on you, he, uh, uh, this scholar didn't say Allah would, would, would give you support. He said Allah has already given you support. SubhanAllah So al-ma'una to other scholars, al al-ma'una to ala qadr al-ma'una. So the harder the amana gets, the, the, the greater the support he gives from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also the rewards. And also subhanAllah by, 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 you know, by thinking about the idea of may of the, 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 the idea of losing the kids after, for example, taking care of him for a couple of days or a couple of uh, weeks or months or years or whatever. Uh, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, So you, they, they uh, endeavor, they, uh, you know, efforts, you know, are praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, this is what we need, subhanAllah. Even if the kids will be taking care of you, will, will, will be taking of you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written you, you, you reward as someone who saved someone's life. Saved was one and then in the Quran says, Woman Ahiaha, Takaanama Ahia Nasazimia, and whoever gives life to someone as if he gives, as if he gave life to you the whole time and kind, subhanAllah. So, what's good luck to make us from them? Amen. Any questions from the room before we go back on? I felt good. I think I'm, I really want to understand that. Mm, yeah. It, oh my goodness. Oh, sorry. I'll just repeat your question <laughs> for the sake of online. Um, which is really more just, yeah, more about what it's like being a foster mother and your experiences. Oh, honestly, I, this is going to sound bad, but sometimes I forget that I'm a foster mom. So I just, <laughs> you just, you fall in love with these kids so much and you just want them to have like an amazing life. Sure. Um, so we just, like just seeing our foster daughter, like I've spoken about this before, but just like her skipping to school. I just know like, you know, she's having a good fun childhood, which is what every kid deserves. We've had so many kids come in like with food issues. We had like a five-year-old girl. She would wake up at five o'clock in the morning before all of us were awake and go to the cupboard, get as much food as she could and put it under the bed. So then we had to, I had to like slowly, you know, somehow help her that you don't have to do this. You've got, you know, you can have eat anytime you want. There's always going to be food available. Um, there's, there was a brother and a sister. I remember once I took them to McDonald's to the playground 
And as soon as they saw the playground, they were like, um, they acted like it was like a big amusement, like it was like Luna Park. Like they were so, 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 so happy. Um, I feel like these kids, they teach us yeah. more about life than what we are able to teach them. They just like teach us to, shows us how resilient these kids are, um, how much they just appreciate everything and how important it is to have um, just a safe and stable home as well because in in our training it teaches us as well that if even if a child is born and there's neglect and you know all the neurons in their brain are not working properly because of what's happened if they are able to have a strong connection with you know whether it's a mother a father they're able to grow up and have those connections with lots of other people um but it's it's been honestly amazing it's been so rewarding and whenever it gets tough i just always remember that you know inshallah our reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's some days that are just unbelievable like losing our the boy that we had for yeah three years that was that was yeah it felt like it felt like I had a child that had passed away that's how it actually felt um and subhanallah my actual arms were numb for about three weeks they were actually numb I couldn't move them anymore like it's like the grief was like inside of me um but subhanallah we just we just keep we just keep going because there's there's kids out there that are going through all of this in life and they're born into this life and it's not their fault you know, and we're the adults, we're able to, you know, I can cry and eat ice cream and, you know, hang out with family and just, you know, feel feel a bit better. And then we have to keep going because these kids, they definitely need us. Yeah. I want to add something that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the sympathy and mercy that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also established, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was the, يعني, part of his mission Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the essence of Islam. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the battle of Uhud, said, يصنعوا يآل جعفر طعاما make make foods, prepare some meals and fruits for the people of Jafar Nabi and take care of his family because you know they've been afflicted with uh, with such a hardship by losing Jafar and that. Here's the here's the narrator of this hadith, Abdullah ibn Jafar. He said that subhanAllah and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was was asking the community to to not neglect these families, subhanAllah, with all the hardship and stuff. So imagine subhanAllah these kids that are that are, you know, under this uh, huge risk, subhanAllah, of, uh, of at least, subhanAllah, of finding, of, you know, of, of, of living a normal life. But living a normal life, subhanAllah. Whereas our community, alhamdulillah, very generous. And subhanAllah, look at in our, in our, you know, our, our fridges or our homes, subhanAllah, a lot of food and a lot of things. And alhamdulillah, financially, we're comfortable here. Inshallah, Allah, we're like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless his name, Allah, we need to give back. We need to give back not only to the poor and the needy uh, overseas. Alhamdulillah, we do that, and this is great. Alhamdulillah, but to our own kids here in the in the community, our in the community that are struggling, they're struggling to find food and they're struggling to find a family or home. And how like finding a home is one of the basic needs in human being. So if we give when you give this to someone, look at the compensation that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will 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 compensate you with, will give you in the dunya and the akhirah. Great, Allahu Akbar, Subhanahu. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, sir, my brother. Why do I love with that charity? I'm sitting here a little bit. I tell you all, girl, I don't know how to watch all. I'm like, and she's like, what big? Like, charity in your home, in the form of the Asia. All you need to do is spend time on. Well, yes. So that's the thing. Um, it did. Like, uh, because then they that all they need is someone to come in their life constantly and show them that they are there. Even if it's an hour, you can make them be there, be that strength that they need. And it's standing there, and it's like, yeah, you know what, subhanAllah, that's enough what you were saying. I remember I was listening to a dear friend of mine talk, and he said, especially to the fathers out there. He said, you know when you have people over and your children are doing their own things and he comes up to you and he says, Baba, look, Baba, look. Well, what's what's the majority of the time our response? Rahman Han, come back to me later. Oh, many for the next shift and I've got people here. And they said, oh, Allah, in that moment, you need to understand that to you, it may not seem important, but to that child in that moment, it's everything. Yes. You know, I mean, subhanAllah, like, and I've always said to my wife, every single morning when I'm at work, the kids have to call me. I have to talk to them. And they need to see me, they need to hear me. And I said to them, I used to say to me, well, why are you busy at work? I go, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. 
It's the simple fact that I show these kids that I will always make time for you. And it doesn't matter what you're going through, how, whatever's happening. I am here to give you that time. So as a, as a father and a raising a child that's not yours, it's not an easy thing to do. So it's very important that we understand that we need to ensure that we do give time because on the law, we had kids come up, came to our care that didn't speak a word of English. Mm. Well, let me put it this way, sir. I had a child come into my care who was mute. They said to us, they don't talk. Mm. She left my care, and I'm going to make you laugh for this one. She left our care, your sheikh, telling me off. <laughs> and this is the child that they said was mute, doesn't talk. SubhanAllah. All we did was sit, talk to her, did that. This is how you say this, this is how you do that, this isn't it. And it's a pun that. And when the care, uh, the case managers come to pick them up, they just look at us and like, what happened? Is this this? Like, yeah, like, all you got to do is just talk. It's a pun a lot. She's like, bye. But you know what? You didn't pack me my toy. You had to look for my toy. And then when you find my toy, you got to send it. I'm like, okay, all right, no, 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 Umayr, yeah, Umayr, what's wrong with you? He goes, Ya Rasulullah, my bird has died. So the narrator said, and Nabi Sallam stayed with him until he started smiling again, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, Sallallahu was so busy, and then, so Ya Umayr, ma'adha fa'ala Umayr, what's wrong with that? What happened to the, to your, to your bird? Did he hear it, SubhanAllah, at this point? So SubhanAllah, those who did not uh, show mercy to others in general, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will never show mercy to them in dunya and in But those who have this beautiful and amazing, you know, this, mercy and compassion in the heart or like these are the the purified and the sound hearts that will be uh compensated on the deep judgment with jannah okay we do have quite a few questions to get through sorry if i have to say um okay one question for muhammad or um what what do you guys think of dcj and the agencies that work with children and can they do what can they do to improve the experience for kids in care um so yeah generally your experience with dcj i'm assuming we don't work directly with GCJ, DCJ because we're with an agency. Okay. But all of our, any work that we have had with DCJ has been professional and we've had no issues with them. Um, like I said, our case manager, we've had a, so we've, I've only ever dealt with three case managers that I've ever had, which was the manager when I first started then another lady, and then she moved on and then I have my current case manager. So what's the name of the agency that? Creating Links. Creating Links. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Really awesome. Um, our case manager and she knows who she is and she's probably watching. And I mean, you meet people in your life who want to help you. And then you meet other people who actually feel what you're going through. And she is a person that would call us. What do you guys need? What's happening? If we have a baby come into our care. Okay. Have you got this? Have you got that? What is after? Do you have formula? Do you want me to do this? It's like, our experience with our agency hasn't been a negative one, alhamdulillah, I mean, I mean, we don't rely on them a lot, but I know and my wife knows that if we do need them, they're there. Okay. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, no, that's because you, yeah, you do hear a lot of that, like the negative stares. There is. Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah, but there, it's good there, to hear. Yeah. There are negative things and I have heard a lot of people say a lot of negative things, but it's hard for me to comment because I don't know if it's been story. Yeah. You know what I mean, like I don't want to tell people it's all rainbows and butterflies when other people are going to be sitting there at home thinking, "Well, no, I've had a horrible experience, and my case manager doesn't do nothing for me, and this and that." And I've heard those stories. But Subhanallah, you just—I'm not too sure you how you need to handle it. From our perspective, we really haven't had that yeah. much negative um, experience. experience. No, that's really good to hear. Um, any other questions from the room? Yes. Um, this other new nation, and I'm struggling whether maybe it was not aware. He had a lot of bad talent that uh, on the front three, he said yes. So the kind of one, two, three, I would say yes. So the kind of how many times you would count my person if they know. So how do you deal with this? You love it. But that's still is the reason why I need to do a broad option. And the broad that just mentioned, I don't know. 
spending more, uh, you know, an hour or two. Um, I, I have time now, which I didn't have with oh. before with you. Uh, you know, so there could be other families out there which is in the same situation that Mark, which is, yeah, half a seat work. Sure. Half a seat work. Yeah. No, no, no. I do work around it. Just, okay. nope. just, just so I can quickly. Um, so the question really is what happens when, of course, there's, there's a difference of opinion, um, to say it politely, where one partner is all on board and the other partner, of course, is hesitant or doesn't really want to go ahead with um, fostering. What are their options? What can they do? I mean, first and foremost, I would say, look, always respect each other. And no matter what, always talk to each other. You're you're married to each other and show Allah to do everything you can to please Allah. Anything I would recommend is just sit down and just talk to your partner. Talk to them and see why did they why did they get come to this uh, answer of no? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? And I say talk to your husband who doesn't want to do it is because I can tell you as a husband, it's my responsibility to ensure that my wife I put a roof over her head and I fulfill all of my Islamic obligations as a husband. And then on top of all that, I need to also ensure that. I fulfill all my obligations as a as a father to these foster children. So as a male and as a husband sometimes, it might be a bit of pressure and we think to ourselves, am I doing too much? Am I going to be able to do this? I even got to a stage where I said to my wife, you know what, I'm worried that I may not be able to do as much as I can. So we may need to take a bit of a step back. And it's upon a lot, that's when we did take a step back when our, the child that was with us for three years, he left our care. We took a bit of a break from fostering. And we took a bit of a break because, one, I could see that my wife needed that time to grieve and go through the process of having that loss. But two, as a husband, I needed that time as well to rebuild my soul because in front of me, I could see, all the, I, I could see that my wife was falling apart and that it was a very difficult time. Even with our family and friends, they were all grieving as well with us. So in regards to that question where our partner says yes and our partner says no, for me, I would say talk to each other as much as you can. But when I say talk, I mean like don't let it always be the same thing you talk about. You just need to talk about it because it's a, it's an amini at the end of the day. And for a father, we know Islamically what we need to do. And I know a lot of fathers who will break their backs to do their best to provide for their families. And then when you're saying, I want to introduce another child into this, another person, another... It's it's a, it's a lot to take in as a father. So I would probably say just try to talk to them as much as you can and just see why it's an early. Sorry, if we could just keep it to questions because we've just got quite a few questions left. So yeah, okay. all good. Thank you. So the, another online question that's coming through. Um, uh, are there opportunities to spend time with the foster children or, t or teenagers? That is, as a friend or a sister, to go to classes or just do normal things like go out to sushi with them to support, um, or but not necessarily be a foster parent. Would anyone know any resources like that? So it sounds like a big brother sister campaign. Yeah. Okay, there are. Okay. So, so you know. yeah, so there are. I, I think there are a few. Um, I think it'd be like a weekend, like respite. Okay, respite. You would still need to go through the process of becoming a foster carer. Okay. But then because foster care is broken up to into certain areas where you can say, well, I don't want to look after the kid seven days a week, but I'm happy to take him on the weekend. So then you go through the process. And then, for example, if my wife and I have, for example, two teenagers, for argument's sake, that we're looking after and we just have something that comes up, we have a wedding Whatever, something comes up. Or my wife and I just want to spend time together. We can reach out to our agency. Hey, can we organize respite for the weekend? And then, for example, the people that we're, we know, yeah. normally, most of the time, we organize it between ourselves and tell the agency, this is who we are. And they already know our approved carers. So then we get it done. And then I'll spend the time with the respite carers and we'll do our thing. So there is ways, but you still need to be approved and mm -hmm. go through the process. Okay. So there is sort of like a network amongst foster carers where they sort of support each other. If like, yeah, I mean, yeah. my wife has a WhatsApp group okay. with all the foster mummers. Yeah. And it's just not surely based for the mum, mummers, foster mummers only. Yeah. And they're always on it, always looking, because they will always, each mother will experience different things. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I watch my wife. I see 
what she what she is going through and I see how tired she is at times and I always tell her okay is anyone struggling is there people out there that don't know what to do what can we do to help people more what can we do so like for example with our charity that we help as well you know I mean we say to people we can try to help all these kids that are also coming into care and we try to do our best but there there is help out there we just you still got to become you still have to be authorized be your ultimate yeah. Yeah. sorry just quickly fit the name. Yeah. Oh. Well, you don't have Okay. But mate. Yep. What's the name of the charity? Mahwal. Oh, that's right. Mahwal was promised. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the room? There's just a lot coming online. I feel like online is a lot too much out of here. No. Yeah. If not, then we'll go to the next. I know for um, the next one, actually, we'll do this one because it's important. Um, the charity organization that you and your wife run, people want to know a little more about the organization, how people can, of course, support you guys and your organization as well. So tell us a bit more about it. Yeah. <laughs> so our organization, it's called Fostering Our Umma. So basically it started with when kids were coming into our care with, you know, garbage bags. Some of them were actually coming with nothing. They would just come and drop us off and some of especially the babies that still have that, you know, the bracelet and the baby blanket that they give them at the hospital and that's it. They would, we would have nothing else. Um, um, so then we would, between the foster mums that we knew, we would, you know, message each other, say, oh, do you have a bassinet? Do you have nappies? You know, the baby's coming in an hour. I don't have time to go to the shops and get anything. Um, so then my husband uh, and I and one of my um, close friends who's a foster mum, we started saying, you know what, let's just, we should do a call out within the community and say, maybe the community can help us out. Every time there's a new, you know, child coming into care, we can put a call out to the community. Um, and then the mashallah, the response from the community was amazing. So then we said, okay, we need to do it the right way. So we started up the charity, um, registered with the ACNC. Um, and then we just let all the foster care agencies know that are in the sort of southwestern area. Um, so they would call us and say, you know, can we get some stuff ready for a three-year-old, five-year-old, whatever age, gender. So then we, ask them, um, and then if they're a Muslim child, we would give them, you know, Quran, a prayer mat. Um, if they were going to a non-Muslim home, we'd put some pamphlets about, you know, what is Islam. Um, and then in the backpack, usually we'd put pajamas, undies, um, socks, some toys. Um, if they're a baby, you know, we'd put baby clothes. Um, we were running this from our shed at our house and then mashallah the, 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 we were always getting calls um, and we needed a lot of things and I couldn't keep going all the time to, um, to the shop so we found a business alhamdulillah that were able to sponsor us for a whole year for a storage unit um, so we our storage unit basically has everything it has Islamic books books clothes toys um, and then we started doing uh, aid gifts for the Muslim kids in foster care uh, we started doing care packages so if there was um, for example, teenagers, they're moving, they're not in their, moving into their own place. They're about 16. They haven't been able to find, you know, a family. We're able to get them some furniture, some clothes, um, kitchenware. Um, if there's a baby and the carer doesn't have anything ready, we were able to get them, you know, like a cot. Um, there was as well, one lady, she reached out to us. There was two young boys that were coming to her. They had absolutely nothing. So we got them beds, mattresses, um, bedding, clothes, toys, we're able to get, yeah, we get them as much as we can. So we are on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, so you can always keep an eye out on our stories. We usually will put a call out if there's, you know, a new case for some new children. Um, and we're always accepting donations to purchase, you know, backpacks, to purchase the clothes, um, to purchase pretty much what's needed. Yeah. So alhamdulillah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did we... Is that... Yeah. I'll get called Boston bombs. Yeah. Um, cause sometimes they're just, oh, sorry. So the question was, um, do you get called to look after non-Muslim children as well? Yeah. So sometimes there's just not enough carers or there's not, no one within their own sort of culture, um, or nationality. So yeah, we have, uh, fostered a few non-Muslim children. Oh. Um, it's, it's been fine. We've just sort of accepted them into our family. Um, you know, they get a bit excited. Like when they see us pray, they want to join in and pray, <laughs> but they've been pretty young. Um, but it does, it does happen. There's a lot of Muslim, um, foster parents that have taken on kids that are, you know, non-Muslim and they've just accepted them with open arms. 
um, and just treat them how would we would treat any other child. So yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, another question: Do you still keep in contact with any of the children they that you foster or will sort of leave your care once they've gone back to their families or once they've reached their age? Uh, yes. So they're. Uh, one on Facebook, we stay in contact with her. So we had her son for about two years. He stayed with us, um, but we always had a really good relationship. I used to, because children in foster care, they'll still see their parents, um, depending on what the court decides. So it could be once a week, it could be once a month. It just depends. Um, so I used to go to those visits and we'd always had a good relationship. Um, so we do keep in contact with her. Uh, there's another little girl. She came to us, I think she was two months old and we had her for about a year. Um, and she ended up going to her grandma. Um, I, we, we ended up losing contact, but we always used to see each other at the shops and I would like beep and go park and tell her, come, I'll drop you guys off. And, you know, they'll jump in and I used to drop them off home. Um, they were so lovely. Um, but other than that, a lot of them, I think they want to sort of forget that, you know, part of their life. Yeah. So a lot of them, you know, weren't keeping contact. Um, but they will always have a case manager to check up on them to make sure they're doing okay with the family and whatnot. But. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Just okay. depends, on the, depends on the family. Yeah, yes. That makes sense. Um, any more room questions? I, there was a previous discussion. So pre, this is me sort of just sneaking in one question on my own, but sort of the nitty gritty requirements of becoming foster carer. So the discussion about, for example, if you've got your own young children, you can't become a foster carer. Um, the room, so you need to have a separate room for the children, for the foster care children. Um, things like that. So are those like, how can people work around that? Or is it just really, quite frankly, they have to wait until their kids are older and things like that? See, I've had a lot of people ask that question. And the one thing I always say to them is irrespective of what your current status is, have that discussion with an agency and actually tell them, tell them, hey, this is my current situation. What can we do? How can we work around it? They need carers. Because they yeah, always they do need carers. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to sit here and promise you that, yes, they will do this and they won't do that. No, no. Just have that conversation with the agency and just tell them because on a lot, everyone's, uh, everyone's position in their own home is going to be different to everyone else's. So yeah. I know I have heard of a lot of people say, oh, no, no, I got told that they can only, uh, stay in their own separate room. But look, for honesty, I've had times where I've had two of my boys sleep in the same room. Because I had no other, I couldn't do anything else. It was either that or they sleep on the couch. And hold on, I'm not going to put a kid on the couch. Yeah. They're two boys, they're together, separate beds. I had to make do in that moment. And I let the agency know and I told them, this is what I can do. This is how I can help you. And, and they said, okay, we'll look into it and just go with it for now. Okay. So the I work is, it's, the important thing is to actually approach the agency and like the yeah. Yeah. And what I keep saying to people is that you got to have these discussions and I'm not saying to devolve, devolve all of your personal information. No, no, but just tell them I live in a four bedroom home. I've got my daughter in one room, my son, in my other room, we're in one room. I've got one spare room. You know, if they're, for example, I had a uh, brother say to me, can I take on two boys, but they're from different families. I said to him, if I've got, if I received a call saying that, I've got two boys from due to your families, but when you know, I wouldn't say no, I'll take them. Yeah. I'll put them in the same room. They're boys. Yeah. You know what I mean? But obviously all of the information will always fall back on what the agency requirements are. And that is why you always got to fall back on the agency and just double check on what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, another way to between like the agency and the plastic care like you and that work um so oh so sorry so what is the relationship between the agency and the foster carer okay um so basically you'd be allocated a case manager when there's a child that's sort of come into care um and that case manager will look at you know the, like they'll do like a cultural plan depending on you know the culture of the child so if if a muslim's going into a non-muslim home they'll put in the plan that they need to you know take them to the mosque get them Islamic items, um, and then they oversee um, all the court, you know, proceedings, um, and then they'll sort of let the carer know, you know, what's happening, you know, whether this child's going to, you know, we think they're going to stay with you for six months, we think it's going to be a year. Um, so that's, yeah, and they do come once a month. There's a home visit once a month to check up on the child, to check up on you, to see what's happening, yeah. Did you want to add anything? I'm sorry, I can't blank. What was the question? 
What's the relationship between the agency and the foster carer? The relationship? In what aspect do you mean relationship? If, what, what's their role? So when a child comes into care, most of the time he'll be, the, the child will be in the care of the minister. minister. Yeah. Yeah. So then the agency will reach out and find a suitable carer and then place that child with the carer. Their role is to ensure that we're doing our bit and are following all policies and procedures. When I say policies and procedures, it's not like work or anything. It's just like making sure they're okay. Make sure you're taking to their doctor's appointment, making sure they're meeting their milestones. If a child is sick or not well, or needs a specialist appointment that you're able to take him. If you're not able to take him, reach out to the agency. Hey, say, Hey, I'm sorry. I'm really stuck. Is that can you help us out? Their role is to ensure that we're doing everything in our cap capabilities to ensure that we're doing everything for this kid. So it, it's, I mean, they've got a responsibility on their head as well to ensure that this kid's looked after. And then we've got a responsibility on our head to ensure that we're looking after this child and that we've been given all the support that we need to ensure that they can get done. So hopefully that's his career. That's what's yeah, Is it a question? <laughs> on text because um from the day first that you have a kid goes into the foster system, the first person that they were responsible to the federal. But based on whichever state that will lead to the okay. the federal actually gave the responsibility to the the to ministers. And then this then there's that contract the agency. And the agency went to the government. So that's the actual legal what's trying to do. Yeah, that, that's the only issue. So, and I don't know how to summarize that. Um, but there are there is a specific way that is structured. Um, the way I understand it is that of course children will fall under DCJ, but DCJ typically um contract the social work or the 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 care of that to non -pro not for profit governments is the way I understand that. So and depending on which not not for profit government is in your area, I believe will assist. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have, oh, oh, questions are still coming in. Sorry. Okay. I'm not sure if I want to ask this question because this, uh, I hate halal and haram questions, but <laughs> for the show, if you are willing to take this, um, if there is time, sorry, no clarification around adoption and what makes it halal or haram. For example, if a child, oh, sorry, I think we've sort of discussed this, but I guess there is that hesitation with people. Um, but I feel like, again, the important thing to sort of discuss is what you've said, that closed adoption doesn't exist in Australia and closes of, closed adoption is what's haram. So it's not really, again, a concern for uh, the way I'm understanding so far for <laughs> Sydney. This is Okay, so first, if you could define what the difference is between closed and open adoption, and Sheikh, if you could comment on that a bit more as well. So closed adoption, from memory, is basically when you're severing and cutting off the ties with the biological family. Open adoption is with what my wife and I have done, is when the ties to the family remain forever. So it's a legally binding uh, order made that the family and us, so the biological family and us, will always remain together and they will remain in the child's life. So it's, it's keeping the biological family in the child's life and ensuring that that's, that connection is never severed. And closed adoption as well, you can not, you don't have to tell the child that they're adopted. So if they had come into your care from really young, you don't have to tell them. But with open adoption from when they're really young, you, as, as best as you can age appropriately explain to them. So what we've. From a young age, we started to tell our son that there's your tummy mummy, that you came from his stomach. Um, but, you know, where I'm your heart mummy. And I always tell him I made dua to Allah, that I wanted a beautiful son. And, you know, this is how you came. So that's, yeah, so that's how we sort of explained it to him. And then he will happily, we would be like going for a walk. And then just a random neighbor would be like, oh, how are you going? He'd be like, do you know I'm adopted? And they'd be like, oh, no way. And he'll explain to them. That's the same to You know, more fun. I love my mum so much, but she couldn't look after me. She wasn't well. So, you know, this is my, um, you know, this is my heart, mum. So that's, it's so important oh, for children to know. Yeah. yeah. I love that. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, so it's, it's really important for children to know. Yeah, they have that. Yeah, you're the heart of that. Yeah, I mean, Rasulullah, I forgot to mention that Rasulullah was the first care as well. Well, we did, we did, we did mention that at the beginning. Because Zayd ibn Harith, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, basically was uh, adopted with his sponsor by Rasulullah sallam. And today, yani, to the extent that, subhanAllah, this beautiful and amazing relationship that we're talking about uh, reminded me of uh, when Zayd, uh, when Zayd ibn Harith's family came, uh, his his father and his family came, pick him. He said, no, 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 I want to stay with Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because, you know, he he loves me so much and why not. So, subhanAllah, Rasulullah sallam, himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looked at kid, uh, so Zayd ibn Harith, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rada. And again, the, 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 the boundaries that Islam has, uh, has set are very clear, right? You cannot, you, you know, they cannot take, uh, you, you, they cannot take your, your, your love name, right? Which means they cannot be part of the, part of your uh, blood kids that mm. would inherit me, right? Very, very clearly. And when they reach the age of puberty, they cannot stay with you in the same, in the same house, in Khulwa, whether they're mahram, whether they are, you know, a, a girl, with with you or boy with you, you know they cannot stay in the same. Thing. So, I mean, are there ways around it? Uh, of course, there are too many ways around it, and it's of course, anyone wanna you know foster someone and they don't know how to do it, whether full time uh, uh, foster carers or part time or whatever, you can reach out to these amazing people and they'll be able inshallah to assist the other I mean, and also, alhamdulillah, our community, Allah and as as I said, the the that awareness is getting uh, you know is getting uh, yeah, I mean, spread in our community, alhamdulillah. And I was surprised how many how many how many foster moms do you have? Um, is that, there's, the increasing? there's about twenty five, and they're all Muslim Ma- moms. Mashallah. Yeah. We need this one. We need to add a zero to here on our website. Two zeros. Inshallah, we need you know more people. And again, you don't have to be full time foster carers, right? Mm. You can be part time, right? Yes. You can add yes. just 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 to make sure that they that they're safe. Mahwoz uh, Mahwoz promise. Inshallah, they're doing a great job. Because subhanAllah, they uh, they take care of almost 50, more than 50, 100 now. She love what? More than 100, uh, 100 kids, subhanAllah, from Afghanistan. Mahbuba himself, she she has in her house 18 kids. 18 kids living with her, subhanAllah. It's plus the kids that, you know, she takes care of uh, of them with uh, with the rest of the people in the in the organization. This is how we should, how this is how the Muslim community should, you know, should look like. Uh, a supportive community, subhanAllah. Mm-hmm. They, they're ensuring that Nobody, no, no, you know, there's no member in the, in, of the community is in need for any help. This is how we should, what we should uh, do, and to the extent that inshallah we start taking care of the Muslim kids as well, subhanAllah. Because they have rights upon us, because we're sharing the same land, sharing the same home, Australia. So they have rights upon us as well. So this, this, this is the view of Islam, subhanAllah, and the view of the Muslim community to ask Allah to bless us all along. Fiction. So we're just wrapping up now. So we can continue this discussion after, after the, after we of talk. course. Um, okay, so just to, to let everyone know, so we are wrapping up, but of course this quiz session is recorded. So if anyone wants to watch it again, you can watch it online. Um, and we do have a couple of gifts for our panelists. For thank you. Gifts. Yes, gifts. gifts. Thank you for a time. <laughs> I think you also said you had gifts for people. Did anyone answer the questions correctly? Give us some gifts for everyone. Thank you. Allah Hirbarit. Thank you. 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 Thank you.